You think God stays in heaven because he too lives in fear of what he's created? Shut the fuck up, Donnie. What can be said about Robert Rodriguez? He's an everyman. He's incredibly stylistic. He makes the most of what he's got. But most importantly, he's from Texas, not Mexico. America's greatest Mexican film director. Actually, I was born in Texas. Rodriguez is actually quite a versatile filmmaker since he is, in his own way, a one-man crew. Almost every movie he's directed also has him credited as a writer, producer, editor, composer, visual vex producer, camera operator, cinematographer. The man is a technical machine of his own caliber and his efforts are nothing short of admirable. He's also known for making the most of the most minimalist of options. Whether making a feature film with a $7,000 budget, having everything shot in front of a green screen, or at the very least, all being filmed in his home state of Texas. In the last 30 years, Robert Rodriguez has proven himself a method man of filmmaking, and with a few solid action films at his disposal, nothing was stopping him from putting asses in seats and entertaining audiences. And nowhere does that show more prominently than with his kids' films. My generation isn't as familiar with the name of Robert Rodriguez, unless you mention films like Sharkboy and Love Girl, but those are some of the movies that made him a global superstar of sorts. You can definitely tell he has range, because even though his action films were filled with gunslinging bloodbaths that can only be rivaled by Raimi and Tarantino, his kids' films were filled with very bizarre digital effects, very, very bright headache-inducing colors and putting kids in the front line showing that with the right tools you can do just as much as adults metaphorically at least both types of films are completely different ballparks and even though one bizarrely stands out more than the others and considering that's the type that i was raised upon i'm spending the entirety of this video giving them their own spotlight so without further ado these are robert rodriguez's bizarre kids films spies. Something's gone wrong. My parents can't be spies. They're not cool enough. That's cool. In the year 2000, Robert Rodriguez renamed his production company Los Hooligans Productions to Troublemaker Studios with his little mascot Pepino as the face of it. They show him in every intro of the company's family films, but every other film... He commits arson. <laughs> And in the following year of 2001, he made his debut in Rodriguez's very first kids' film, Spy Kids. Never send a grown up to do a kid's job. <laughs> Spy Kids. Starting off strong with what might as well be the best movie on this list, and that's saying a lot for a movie called Spy Kids. It's not exactly the same caliber as Kung Fu Panda, but it's trying. Drugs. It's also trying drugs. The movie follows two siblings, Carmen and Juni Cortez, who are forced with the task of saving their secret Asian parents after they've been captured by a TV show host, Floop, host of Floop's Fooglies, which is a title plenty enough to give your tongue a hernia. The parents were captured in an attempt to rescue missing OSS operatives when they're believed to be used as Floop's Fooglies for the show, and in this case, Agent Hank Hill. I tell you what, Bobby, uh, them spy kids ain't right, I tell you what. Yeah, I'm not kidding, that's Mike Judge, creator of Beavis and Butthead and King of the Hill. Where's my mom and dad? You're talking like a song from The Lion King. Stop that, it makes no sense. I'll try to keep my King of the Hill references to a minimum, but I make no promises. Shame! And this isn't one of those run-of-the-mill kids doing undercover stuff, outsmarting stinky adults type of movies that followed this one because the kids in this are actually supposed to be in a safe house, but they keep getting forced into situations they have little to no control over, so they're basically forced as a last resort to save their parents, in a choice they make themselves. And the charm of this movie comes from the family itself. Everyone in the family is somehow disconnected from one another. The father, Gregorio, played by Antonio Banderas, yearns for the days he and his wife were out on missions, his wife Ingrid, played by Carla Guguino, misses that life too, but also tries to maintain the emotional bond between everyone. The older sister Carmen, played by Alexa Pena Vega, is kind of a rebel who feels pressured into looking after her feeble little brother Juni, played by Daryl Sabara. He has no real friends and no real connection with his sister, nor his father, and he's constantly chastised for hiding his inadequacies by watching Floop's TV show. Guys, he's seven. Cut him some slack, okay? Bart Simpson is ten and he still watches a clown. Hell, when my little brother was seven, he was watching a TV show about trains with faces like sex dolls. It's not that strange. Why the hell is it a bomb? 
But what's even better, these kids aren't stupid. They actually think quite logically with all that's thrown at them. They act like real siblings who bicker with each other, so there's some solid realism for a movie that has humanoid robots with thumbs for limbs. Yeah, if I'm lucky, that'll be the only time I say that in life. On the other side of the spy game, you have Gregorio and Ingrid trying to escape Floop's lair, and Banderas does have his occasional mugging scenes that you're gonna see throughout the rest of these movies, but for the love of God, it's Antonio Banderas, one of the most charismatic actors of our generation. Stop that! Right now! He turned out so delicious. Mm. Plus, trust me when I say that with the mugging, thumb thumbs, and other weird, really weird things in this movie, it's the tamest these movies are gonna get. This is only the tip of the iceberg, folks. We got some weird shit coming our way. Just relax, lay about, or my fist will put you out. Dream, dream, dream. Mom, can you pick me up? I'm scared. Floop invents android children that resemble actual children with incredible strength but don't have functioning brains programmed. And having children play robots seems fitting if a lot of them can't act, the dead faces fit the role with some glowing eye effects, adding even more. And Alan Cumming didn't have to be this amazing as Floop, but by god he is. He's a very eccentric child at heart with truthfully an honest heart of gold. And he honestly reminds me of the updated Willy Wonka in some ways with his design. Artificially colored creatures and a clear vision to entertain children. This is honestly what I wish Johnny Depp's portrayal of Willy Wonka was more like, as opposed to, you know, <laughs> you're really weird. Whatever the hell this is. The idea for a film like this spawned from an anthology film Rodriguez did a portion of called Four Rooms. In a segment called The Misbehaviors, a suave dad played by Antonio Banderas and his wife are going out for a New Year's Eve party while the kids stay in the hotel and eventually cause mischief. With everyone dressed in nice suits, Rodriguez got to thinking, what if they could all be a family of spies? Five years go by and he calls up his agent and says, I got an idea for y'all niggas <laughs> you think with a kids movie like this from an action director it would be more played down for a general audience but in this case rodriguez doesn't treat the kids watching like they're stupid he treats the cortez kids like they're the smartest characters in the movie and sure this movie is meant to appeal to a younger demographic <gasps> But Rodriguez doesn't hold back his prowess as an action movie director, because for a kid's film, a lot of the action sequences are pretty engaging and really fun to watch. A lot of things in this movie are a lot better than I remember them to be when I was watching it endlessly when I was a kid. Speaking of which, believe it or not, this movie was the start of the MCU. That's right, the Machete Cinematic Universe. They just fucked with the wrong Mexican. Cool. Yes, my friends, this is the same machete who used the guy's intestines as a down elevator. Or more so, the machete that used the guy's intestines as a down elevator is also the same machete who's the uncle of the spy kids. Considering his character was originally created for this movie for the great Danny Trejo, but wasn't given his own movie until 2010. And I kept trying to tell him, it's a trailer, and, and I was... I, I didn't know we were going to make them. Boy. <laughs> Rodriguez loved the idea of Machete and wondered why he was never expanded upon. So what started as a main side character in a spy family film eventually became a fake trailer made by Rodriguez for Grindhouse and eventually no longer fake and became a full-blown R-rated action film with a sequel and, not gonna lie, that's pretty tits. Sadly, Machete is one of the more underutilized elements of the film, and they foreshadow him a lot with flashbacks and all the spy gear he's made, but he himself is barely in the movie for 15 minutes. And considering he's an integral part of the journey, and even though he has his own movies now, at the time this movie was out, it seemed like there should have been more scenes with him. He and Rigorio are strange brothers for reasons they keep hinting at, but never giving it away. But maybe it's better that way since the brothers are reunited with a pretty funny payoff. Why did you come back? For the same reason I left. You know what? I don't remember that reason. Neither do I. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay. Honestly, this is a really solid family film with a lot of solid comedy, engaging action sequences, and decently fleshed out characters to make it an enjoyable blockbuster. It's about conquering your fears and taking chances for the ones you love in a way that's really endearing when you see the family come together. Whether it's Carmen and Junie encouraging each other near the end of the film, or all of them feeling closer as a family with this action-packed adventure. And with a film such as this, grossing over $147 million with a $35 million budget, a sequel was more than necessary. And that's the mission worth fighting for. How long have we been falling? I hate gravity! I 
don't know. My watch doesn't tell time. Oh, shit. <laughs> Punch me, I bleed. In 2002, just a year after the first movie, came the first sequel, Spy Kids 2, The Island of Lost Dreams, which is a very misleading title since the movie has very little to do with dreams. That's like if Star Wars Episode 1 was called Episode 2, Attack of the Sand. Sand. More sand. sand. So much sand, you really wouldn't believe it. So as of now, there's nothing here to dream about. Dream, dream. Mom, for God's sakes, where are you? A year has passed since the events of the first movie, and since then, the OSS has opened up a new Spy Kids division, with Carmen and Junie obviously being the first. They're not necessarily the top spy, since they're in competition with the level 1 Spy Kids, Gary and Gertie Giggles, children of Donegan Giggles. <laughs> oh, my tooth fell out. Seriously, you have so many G's in your name, you're bound to give anybody you talk to a debilitating st 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 <laughs> Carmen and Junie are still stuck at level 2 rank, and things don't get much better when attending an OSS awards banquet, all the adults are knocked out, and a group of henchmen steal the movie's MacGuffin, the Transmoker device, which has the power to shut off all electronic devices. Gary gets in the way of retrieving the Transmoker, which causes the bad guys to get away and have him frame Junie, resulting in being immediately decommissioned. Failure. With this tragic news, Carmen takes it upon herself to hack into the OSS mainframe, reinstate Juni, and tag them onto Gary and Gertie's latest mission, where they believe the Transmoker device is being kept, leading them to a mysterious island where no electronics nor any other spy gadgets work. And if that wasn't enough, the island is inhabited by a bunch of giant animal crossbreeds created by the only human on the island, a genetic scientist named Romero, played by Steve Buscemi. Is this actually what hell looks like after the wood chipper? Oh yeah? Much like the first movie, one half is focused on the spy kids, whilst the other half is focused on the parents, but they really knew how to take the cool out of them since they sacrificed the cool spy espionage for tacky comedy. Especially when they bring the grandparents in like every other parent sequel feels the need to do. Even if some people out there love these actors, they're sadly wasted since they serve literally no purpose other than to nag Antonio Banderas so he can make more funny faces. <laughs> Which isn't entirely a bad thing since Banderas' comedic timing is still on point. And much like the first movie, not every joke works, but it's charming when they do. <laughs> Something like that. Plus, it's nice to see the family is actually more connected since the original, and each one of them having scenes that show how much closer they've become as a family, which is, once again, really charming. Uh-uh. I'm not. We are gonna... But yeah, that doesn't stop the increase of mugging shots and gross-out jokes. Yeah, Pope! Cortez's. Now picking your nose. Also supplied with a lot of subpar pratfalls that I really want to be funny, but only with the right audio replaced. Pocket sand. Come here, I'm gonna kick your ass! Use his own weight against him! We really shouldn't be announcing our attack strategy! Rush him! Damn it, Goku! Sadly, this sequel isn't as strong as the original in a few ways. The plot or narrative isn't nearly as interesting nor engaging as it tends to play a lot of homage to better films, and somehow feels like a made-for-TV sequel with all the obvious green screen backdrops and special effects that resemble the Dinotopia miniseries, making this feel cheaper in some of the worst of ways. And since Rodriguez is making the most of what he's got, Mike Judge is back as Donegan Giggles since they both live in Austin, Texas. And now he's the bad guy wanting control of the Transmoker device to take over the world just, just because we're not really given any reason as to why. A lot of the more interesting characters from the first movie serve more as cameos, which is kind of lame, but with what little you see of them, they still bring a lot of personality. Cell phone, internet access, satellite TV, you name it. Had baby will do everything but tell you what time it is. It doesn't tell time? No, there was so much stuffed into it, there was no more room for the clock. Believe it or not, this is one of the first mainstream theatrical films to use digital cameras alongside something like Attack of the Clones, which directly inspired Rodriguez to do so, making green screen effects more cooperative, with less edge, and automatically more threshold. Clean. This film only costed $3 million more than the first film's $35 million budget, and both were box office hits, making over $100 million. I mean, there's still a few things with this film lacks that made the original so unique, but it's mostly solid and still harmless family fun. And even with its faults, it's miles better than the next entry on this list, so stay tuned for that. Well then, hold on to your seat, because here's the reality. 
Your sister's missing. Move over, Sword Art Online. I hate you! Before you were the most watched piece of shit, in 2003, Rodriguez gave a Spy Kids 3D game over. Thankfully, no microtransactions, but there's not enough space on your memory card for what a big load this one is. Very unimpressive. Computer nerds. <laughs> Believe it or not, this is the one Spy Kids film I watched the most when I was a kid, not because I liked it more than the other two, but because it was the only one we owned on DVD, whilst the other two we owned on VHS. But then again, I love the idea of being able to enter a video game, ever since that Ultra Sheen episode of Jimmy Neutron aired the same year. Taste llama milk, Star Destroyer. No! I'm allergic! But then again, I also love the idea of cartoon characters coming out of my TV, which resulted in... Humble beginnings, I guess. So Junie has left the OSS since the end of the last film and now works as his own private investigator. Going solo can get bleak after a while until he's recruited by the OSS to save Carmen after her mind gets lost in a new virtual reality video game. If Junie doesn't shut down the game within 12 hours before the game's launch, the children of the world will be held prisoner to the game's developer. Yeah, I wasn't kidding when I said this was literally Sword Art Online. Kids trapped into VR world on launch day by the creator and the only way to get out is to win the game, just six years before the manga's launch in Japan. And if this is anything like Sword online hopefully they'll be less incest stop it get some help remember how donnegan became the bad guy in the second movie with no clear reason or development well he's a good guy again currently employed once again at the oss even though he was fired in the last movie i know some jobs reach out to employees they let go for a second chance but this guy hacked your systems to make him president and tried to claim global domination i think that's enough on the resume to just say nope mrs giggles must have stringed you out I certainly did. Let's be real though, guys. It's Salma Hayek. She can straighten any man out. Okay, whatever. Once again, Rodriguez pushing the technological advantage by having more than 90% of the film be in front of a green screen, and with all the bright colors some of these kids' movies have, you'll have an eyesore in no time. Not to mention, this film was released in 3D, so not only are the graphics so brightly lit and lackluster that they make Toontown Online look like Skyrim, but it can also be viewed in eye-popping red and blue to give you a massive migraine. <laughs> And even better, since the Blu-ray they have for this movie doesn't have 3D capabilities nor the glasses for it, every little effect just jumps at you like, whoa, look at what's popping out at you. But it feels so phoned in, like it adds practically nothing. If I'm seeing a 3D movie or something in IMAX, I expect some sort of visual immersion that a regular screening can't do. I've gotten more immersion from the Regal Cinema's roller coaster than whatever this film gives me. And in this case, it's bittersweet nostalgia. Put on these glasses and you'll enter the world of the game. You go in, find your sister, help her shut down the game in 12 hours, or it's game over for everyone. The original DVD this was released with came with 3D glasses, provided of course you bought the right version, as well as two separate discs for 2D and 3D versions. As far as I know, the 3D version is the only one exclusive to come with an introduction from Floop, explaining the events of the first two movies, and when to use your 3D glasses. But for now, take off your glasses. You won't need them for about, ooh, 15 minutes or so. Don't worry, you'll know when to put your glasses on. When one of the main characters puts his on, you do the same. They still have the glasses in the film with the 2D Blu-ray version, and any time you're in the game or anyone outside of the game is wearing glasses is when the 3D version would tell you to put them on. <laughs> Dinkelberg! Is something wrong, dear? Along the way, Junior runs into some beta testers for the game and serves as your typical token group with nerdy guy, strong silent guy, and cool guy. And junie has got wood for this mysterious punk chick in the game who, in a way, clouds him from acting like an actual spy. And the most prime example of this is when Junie finds a health pack and does the absolute dumbest thing ever. I got extra life, Demetra. Congratulations. You'll need it the most. I want you to take it. Hey, Demetria, I know I'm trying to save my sister and the children who will be the future of this world from preventable enslavement whilst also being observed by highly trained operatives, even though no one is telling me not to do this, but it's clear enough I've got wood for you, so... You absolute horn dog. Well, Julie, I hope it was worth it that nothing bad happens in the next five minutes. Game over. 
they ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. The whole reason these people are following Juni is because he's believed to be the guy. You're the guy. 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 I'm the guy. The guy. The guy. The guy. Guy. More so the guy from the advertising of the game. Hold on to your joysticks, boys. Good night, everybody. But of course, he's just saying that because. But come to find later, the real guy is actually Elijah Wood making a brief cameo and the funniest joke in the whole movie. Cake. Oh my. Oops. Speaking of people who don't belong here, Sylvester Stallone plays the toy maker, who's trapped in cyberspace and plans to use the gamers to have one activated switch at the end of the game that could either shut down the game or release him. And surprisingly, he's the only lead actor here actually having fun, as he gets to play four versions of himself. Impossible, sir. The way the game's AI works is one. I know, I know, I know. Can I just talk to myself at least? You are talking to yourself. I am you. Well, <laughs> you, me. Shut up. So be it. Am I insane? Completely. <laughs> and one with a really dope black snakeskin suit that makes him look like a fucking pimp. Speaking of toys, I won a raffle in fifth grade and got to pick a prize from a goodies bag, and for two whole weeks, I saw this cross-promotion comic you get with a kid's meal at McDonald's. The first two movies had blatant advertising in the finished product, but Game Over just had its toys. This comic from memory seemed like Kolioko slash Tron, where they entered a virtual world to stop some kind of evil. Hell, I remember Junie spilled a McDonald's Coke over some circus, and that solved the problem. Remember, kids, McDonald's may solve depression, but it won't solve type 2 diabetes. We make a pretty Pretty good team, sis. Spy Kids rule, eh, Junie? 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 By the way, I wasn't kidding when I said this movie was over 90% green screen. It's better than the last movie's effects, but most actors aren't even properly integrated. Oh, come on, at least Fat Albert's green screen running was so cheap that it was laughable. This is also laughable, but not as enjoyable. You're both just awful. And even though this film was made with the same budget as the second movie, the advent of 3D films helped the movie gross over $200 million worldwide, almost twice as much as the last movie made. Like a lot of these early mid-2000s kids movies, a lot of people either see them as terrible or they see them as cheesy good nostalgia that at this point you could watch only when drinking with friends. I don't blame them, I've debated getting lit and watching Dougal. Someone has to. Also, Junie. You had a chance to bring Machete in the game, but you chose Grandpa for his intellect? First off, Machete knows machines, so he probably knows more than your grandpa does in this sense, and you missed your chance on getting our long-anticipated Machete Kills in Space sequel, while your grandpa just wanders off the moment he gets his legs. Way to fucking go, buddy. Not to be a critic, but your film stunk! What are you, some kind of critic? Kids get a point. If you want to stop the darkness from destroying our worlds, come with us. You better go with them. Adding more to the fact that Rodriguez never sleeps. I haven't slept in eight days! The same year of 2005, he released one of the most stylistic and unique comic book films of all time. And another one for the kids. Yeah! But this movie is oddly enough like Kids Bop because it's made by kids for kids. Or rather, it was a creative influence by Rodriguez's second born son, Racer, and based around the dreams he had about the superheroes that would soon be the stars of their own movie, The Adventures of Shark Boy and Lava Girl. Which is cute, but it seems about the same as the movie getting a 19% on Rotten Tomatoes and putting the blame on the kid. Um, he did it. What? You're not watching The NeverEnding Wizard of Oz, but with all this David Lynch dreamlike talk, you might as well be seeing Munchkins. Dream Max. Now, what do you see? I see a... Okay, I'll try to keep my Twin Peaks jokes to a minimum, and trust me, I'm trying.
But yeah, the premise of this movie is that this introverted kid named Max literally puts his everyday problems to sleep by having dreams about his own world that he can escape to called Planet Drool with two superheroes he made up, Shark Boy and Lava Girl. And apparently his dreams are so powerful that they become real and start to coexist with his world when the heroes take him to Planet Drool to save it from the corrupted Mr. Electric, played by the lowrider himself, George Lopez. This is all wrong. Someone else's dreams are in here. We've been waiting for you, my child. No worry, I'm not gonna bore you with the details of the plot since no one else who remembers this movie really cares either. I'll give it this. The movie is so bizarre and easy to keep and lose your attention that it's more memorable than Spy Kids 2, if that makes any sense. This is one of those good, bad movies that people saw when they were around 8 or 10 and nowadays enjoy either shit-faced or absolutely baked. Stop it! And just like the last two Spy Kids films, it's almost entirely shot in front of a green screen with effects so unpolished they start to resemble the likes of Food Fight. Ew! Then again, I'm such a sucker for the colors purple, blue, and black that a lot of these backgrounds on the brink of space really relax me and put me at ease. Okay, yeah, it's no Wally -E or Blade Runner 2049, but the color blending is nice enough for a kid's movie such as this. Everything that is, or was, began with a dream. We live inside a dream. And yes, everyone in the comments section, that kid with the mid-2000s spiky jailed haircut is in fact, Taylor Lautner. And say what you will about who he plays and you know what, but damn it, he's perfectly cast here. Everyone else's performances in this movie are just enough to fill their roles and not much to write home about, but I don't think this movie would be as enjoyable if it wasn't for him. For better or for worse. He can be funny when he needs to be, angry, smug, and his martial arts training go hand in hand with everything else. And you know what, I'll also give props to the actor who plays the bully, Linus. Much like Ivan Ooze, he's relishing in the fact that he's playing a despicable villain. burst your bubble dream boy. Well, at least there's some actors here chewing the scenery as opposed to the scenery chewing the actors. He ruined my dream journal! Objection! I did not! Mr. Electric, send him to the principal's office and have him expelled! Slap I know everything! And you know nothing! The movie was made for $50 million, grossed $72 million worldwide, but sadly only made $39 million in the US, technically making it a box office bomb. And considering the movies that were out at the time, it seems they had everyone else covered, so whomever else wanted to see this, what small percentage it was, it worked out for them at least. I mean, what else can I say about this movie that I haven't said about Spy Kids 3? Is it a good, bad movie? Yes. Can you enjoy it hammered? Yes. Are there elements about it that blur the line between cheesy and stupid to an enjoyable degree? Yes! Sometimes I don't have other words than just see it for yourself. You're not gonna see a lot of movies like this, so take advantage of it and have yourselves a time. Dream us out of here! We believe in you, Max. Nope. And you know, on the topic of video games and projects made by kids for kids, this video is sponsored by Axe Cop on Steam. Axe Cop is a comic book series created by brothers Ethan and Malachi Nicole. At age 28, Ethan was able to turn his five-year-old brother's stories and characters into an official comic book series following the adventures of a tough cop who solves crimes by blunt force with an axe. It was written by a five-year-old, just go with it. And since its launch in 2009, it's received numerous praise on the internet, its own cartoon series, and in this case, a licensed video game on on Steam. Let me put this in perspective for you. The very first level has you going around as a cop wielding an axe and cutting the heads off dinosaurs. Woof. What more do you want? The game works like a top-down RPG resembling to Pokemon and Final Fantasy with brightly contrasted graphics to give that new age yearning for the old age of gaming vibe we've come to love over the past decade. And if you play your cards right, the game is a damn good time. x cop is his own flavored hero, kind of like Peacemaker, where the only way justice can be seen is with brutal murder. I cherish peace with all my heart. I don't care how many men, women, and children I need to kill to get it. Oh, and adding to that, everyone in town absolutely despises him for it. But he's his own man and couldn't care less, so there's a layer of humor I wasn't really expecting to appreciate. And by the looks of some of these bosses, you can't blame them for being unique. You got an evil Santa shredding a guitar. And this thing. I think I saw them remaster this lately. What was it? Oh god, no! Nah. nah, I'm kidding. But there's a wide variety of bosses to go around with an addicting RPG element to accompany it. It's currently $10 on Steam, so head on over to get your money's worth and have yourself a time all that changed when i found the rock it's a wishing rock you make a wish and then it comes true i wish i had friends i was hoping for something a little more menacing i will show no mercy 
You're hired. Hey, wait a minute. This can't be a kid's movie made by Robert Rodriguez. There's no terrible CGI nor green screen backdrops. What do you mean this was made by the same director? I mean, we still got the main protagonist being an awkward, skinny, friendless dork, so one out of three ain't bad. Yes, folks, we're at the point of Rodriguez's most unique film since the first Spy Kids with 2009's Shorts. And by unique, I don't just mean outside of the universe of Spy Kids and Lava Girl, but much like the original Spy Kids, this movie was made with a lot of personality and can be enjoyed by the same crowd of people who like the Diary of a Wimpy Kid movies. Except for the fourth one, that one doesn't exist. Eat your heart out, Pulp Fiction. This movie may not be a pretty fucking good milkshake, but it's certainly not a pumpkin pie flavored sewer rat. Much like some of Rodriguez's other film projects, the movie consists of an ensemble cast with nonlinear storytelling and structure. The beginning might be the middle, the end might be the beginning, and the middle might be the end. Have I lost you yet? Yeah, my brain hurts. With films like Sin City and Pulp Fiction, it's not as direct to identify who the main character would be amongst an ensemble cast, but in this case, we're mainly following this kid named Toby, played by Jimmy Bennett, who looks like Jacob Chapman with too much grease in his hair. And much like every other lead character in these movies. We're both outsiders. We're both ignored. We're lonely and boring and always getting in trouble because we have nothing else better to do. <sighs> it's nice when the movie points out the repetitive character traits for me. He's constantly getting picked on by what might as well be this movie's Helga Pataki, his school bully, Helvetica Black. And yes, that is her real name, and that's the font you write it in. This Helga Pataki of a brute spends most of the movie pushing him around because he's not a rude boy, and her checkerboard shorts and handbag don't agree with that. <laughs> This movie doesn't have Marcellus Wallace, but instead, all the characters are brought together through the power of this wishing rock that's shown to us through a series of nonlinear episodes with a focus on a different group of characters every time until it all comes together in the finale. And much like Sin City and Pulp Fiction, some sequences are better and more remembered than others. I can guarantee you Jimmy Bennett's expressive and cocky performance is much more memorable than this ditzy Francais. How would you like your braces up your nose? Your braces. Where are they? Up my nose. And you know what? I'm gonna give it to the whole cast. Practically every child in this movie delivers a great performance. So far, the only young actor we've seen make a truly great performance was Taylor Lautner. And that's not a thing I say often. Maybe you need to go to the hospital. You in the hospital. Practically every kid in this movie is giving 110%, and for a kid's movie of this caliber, it's pretty solid. And if nothing else, you can tell Jimmy Bennett is having a lot of fun. Say hello to my little friend, Mr. Thompson! I gotta tell you, this whole movie feels fresh considering everything else is a lot more natural than it did the last few movies we've looked at. Actual sets and locations, no phone and green screen throughout the whole runtime, actors who actually feel like they want to be there, goofy CGI but not as poor in low res as before, yet goofy enough for this kind of film. Or at this point, would it be like throwing a hot dog down a hallway? Hell, the whole non-linear storytelling is actually kind of a joke since the story is being told from the perspective of an average middle schooler who can't keep track of an hour and a half narrative. Is that what happened next? See that wishing rock I'm holding? It made things so confusing, I can hardly remember the order of events. I'm probably going to have to tell you the story completely out of order. But one of the shorts, specifically the one they show before the opening credits, feels so out of place and leaves such little impact that it should have just been deleted. It's basically just two siblings who are having a never-ending staring contest that goes on for hours and even days. They keep it up throughout the rest of the film in the background as a running gag, but the payoff? is just weak. You blinked! 35 hours, 15 minutes, and 20 seconds, and you bleat! You lose, loser! Loser! And no, these kids had literally nothing to do with the plot happening around them, or even outside their window with James Spader as a giant black cubix toy and his children as giant insects. What the f*** am I watching right now? Maybe that's why it was put before the actual credits, so Rodriguez can fool you into thinking there's more than there actually is. But there isn't. This isn't like Tropic Thunder where they showed those hilariously fake trailers for other films to give you the basic ideas of the actors the real actors are playing. But I will give Rodriguez brownie points for some of these special effects. See this interior shot of the mouth? Those tiny UFOs 
are CGI, but the mouth isn't. They actually made a large sized model of Jimmy Bennett's mouth that was made for quite an impressive shot. Sometimes that little extra effort goes a long way. This movie was made with a $20 million budget and only made back $29 million worldwide and just barely enough with the US which seems pretty low considering these movies have a knack for putting asses in seats. Maybe it was just too weird for its own good and maybe people were getting tired of Rodriguez's kids movie quirks or maybe just not willing to accept his change. Look guys, we can't all go from music to music to music to space trauma or even apocalypse to pigs to penguins and apocalypse again, but everyone needs to give their brain some wiggle room every now and then. It definitely had my cousin and I's attention upon Upon its release. And you know, this movie still has the bizarre quirks that can only come from Rodriguez, but that aside, the movie itself is pretty damn enjoyable. It's not that funny as some of the jokes can fall flat. I wish I had telephony six. But I do appreciate the effort that was made for this outside of making the most of the least. It has its gross childish moments, but nothing that tries too hard to be trendy nor pandering. The same reason I appreciate the Diary of a Wimpy Kid movies, not the fourth one. And if nothing else, I recommend you guys check it out. It's worth at least one viewing in my opinion, but trust me when I say once I close this one out, it only goes down from here. Not the best, but certainly not the worst. So check it out and see for yourself. I wish we were in a Hollywood movie. Yeah. Like that's gonna happen. I don't know if it's worth five dollars, but it's pretty fucking good. Our stepmother's a spy? I still think this is a prank. This is not a prank. <sighs> the dog is talking. I noticed. Well, Rodriguez thought if you can't try something new, do what the 2010s did best by marketing off nostalgia. And that's exactly what he did when in 2011, we got spy kids all the time in the world. A new generation of spy kids, but without any of the charm the franchise started with. Even from the trailers, I knew this wasn't going to take off. Well, if anything, since it's on IMDb's bottom 100 list, it took off as well as the Challenger shuttle. Yeah, I'm not even gonna try to search for cool music to present this movie to you guys. This movie sucks. But it's not even enjoyably stupid like Shark Boy and Lava Girl. It's basically everything people were afraid the original Spy Kids was gonna be like. Kids outsmarting adults because they're stinky, poop jokes, poorly CGI talking animals. Could this be anything more like the worst the early 2010s had to offer? At least with Spy Kids 3D and Lava Girl, Rodriguez was abusing what was cool and what people genuinely liked from that era, but this? Where do I even begin? Well, let's go over my very first gripe with this movie, our villain. Now, I want you to guess, for a movie involving time, what could his name be? Well, the answer to that question is another question. What's the worst possible name you could think of to give a villain about time? It's literally the first thing you're thinking of. Don't you dare deny it for one second, otherwise you'd be smarter than this movie. Subject known as TikTok. Boy, I hope there's no clock puns. Not this time. Clean her clock. So what makes tick tock tick? You're back on the clock. Right on time. Hickory dickory dock. The spy ran up the clock. Better luck next time. You're really starting to tick me off. Time flies. Any more time. What about us? I just need time. That'll stop your clock. Time to stop! It's time to stop! Okay, okay, let me slow down a sec. Believe it or not, Rodriguez never meant to make this movie. At least he believes it wasn't time yet, no pun intended, for the franchise to make a revival. In fact, he was pressured into making this movie since he had one movie left to make in his contract with the Weinstein Company. I'm not gonna dump the whole story on you, I recommend you look it up for yourself, but basically, in a nutshell, the blame for this movie is all on Harvey Weinstein. He can't keep getting away with it! I mean, don't get me wrong, this movie is still crap, but because of reasons, it was obviously made with little to no passion from Rodriguez. Since the time wasn't right, he made it, so I can't say I blame him entirely for this movie. I'm still gonna complain why it sucks as a film itself, but I just wanted to clear the air on that matter. Let's just get this over with. So the plot of this movie is that somehow time is being sped up because time is apparently being wasted, and at the cost of 
TikTok and his partner, the Timekeeper, the only thing they need to complete their plan is a gem called the Chrono Sapphire, which is in possession of one of the spy kids in this movie, who currently aren't spies because the spy kids division was shut down years ago, as was this franchise's credibility. <laughs> Just like the first movie, the kids are our primary target, so they need to be protected as much as possible, but also eventually have to take matters into their own hands. Truly the Force Awakens of its kind. Since it was also released the same day as the road chip. Stop it. I understand you have to reintroduce this for a new generation, and sometimes old ideas get recycled as new ones, but that doesn't mean they were recycled for a better use. I love these horses, but that doesn't mean they'll be better if recycled for glue. Imagine the elements that made the first movie good that were reused here, but for all the wrong reasons. Carmen and Juni were competitive with each other because they were too different and never got along, but eventually were forced to put their brains together to overcome obstacles for the good of saving their parents. That is not the case for Rebecca and Cecil Wilson here. Siblings being competitive has now been taken to an almost literal degree since that's basically all they do. Last piece of bacon. My breath holding contest. You're on. <gasps> <laughs> One point for me. I saved your life. One point for me. First person to get the bad guy wins. Game on. First person to get across without being smushed wins. That's their relationship in a nutshell, and there's absolutely no charm in it like there was between Carmen and Juni. Not once do you ever see them relate to one another, and thus it seems like there's little to no connection for them to be a good enough duo. And individually, they have nothing going on, and practically feel like a one-note character. Rebecca loves pulling pranks, and Cecil is apparently good at anagrams or something. It's not a coat. It's an anagram. It's another anagram. Did you know your name is an anagram? The principal called me about your pranks. Best prank Yet. You're really stepping up your game with these pranks. And pranks. Pranks. I mean, as far as their performances go, they're mostly fine, but I'll be damned if I didn't want to punch Rebecca for more than half the movie. Joel McHale plays their father and Jessica Alba their stepmother and has to keep it a secret from them that she was a spy. But even before then, Rebecca gives her nothing but shade for no other reason than she doesn't want her to replace their deceased mother. Stepmother is always late for everything. There's something she's hiding from us. Doesn't mean she deserves your blue cheese dressing bomb. My best prank yet. Do you guys need anything? My mom. No. No. Leave my kids alone. Step kids. Even when she comes to rescue them, she still gives her sh and stop calling her stepmom. You can call her by her first name and not have it sound like you're in a porno. Oh yeah, they also have this talking dog robot named Argonaut, voiced by Ricky Gervais. And give him credit, with what little he was given, he makes the best of it by spouting comedic delivery that clearly shows he doesn't give a shit that he's in this movie. Pop it back on, anytime you're ready. Good thinking. <laughs> no, seriously, you can have it back now because I am gonna fall over. I love this, I love sticking my head out the window. It's my favorite thing. The Timekeeper. That's not much of a villain's name, is it? Oh, the Timekeeper. Oh, has he got a watch, has he? Are you sure this is the place? Let's think. He's called the Timekeeper. This is a room full of clocks. Nah, let's go, let's check out the cheese shop across the road. <laughs> now this is fun to watch. Yeah, baby's uh, got a surprise for you. <laughs> Don't get, this is it, Rib, that's it. <laughs> Just, uh... Baby's first steps! You're more impressed by a kid standing up than a dog that can talk? Just like last year's Golden Globes, he clearly doesn't care, so he's gonna go out having fun. Because she loves nothing better than plonking herself down on the carpet, lifting her leg, and licking her But don't worry, the film really tries to get you nostalgic for the original here with all the little easter eggs and having Carmen and Juni come back as the only returning cast members from the original trilogy. Well, Danny Trejo makes a two second cameo and it adds really nothing at all. And apparently Antonio Banderas was in this movie, but his scenes were completely cut. And to their credit, what little we see of Carmen and Juni, it's like the chemistry never left. Where have you been the last seven years? If I told you then it wouldn't be called a secret mission. It's not like I missed you or anything. I needed a break from your face. Oh. What an incredible coincidence. You don't deserve to wear this badge. Oh. Thanks. You're welcome. There we go. Junie! Hmm. Unfreeze her. But it's so peaceful and quiet. This never would have happened if I was mission leader. <sighs>
But outside of the little credits I gave out there, this movie is still the worst on our list, no question. All of the charm of the original has been replaced by the likes of Show Dogs and literally any other talking animal movie you can think of or anything made by Raja Gosnell. Cats and Dogs gets a pass. But with all that said and done, we have one more on this list, so let's try to go out with a bang. By the way, what kind of henchman masks are these? Just rubber clocks with no holes to see or breathe? Great design choice there. I can't see fucking shit out of this thing. This was the day our heroes fell. All of them. And hey, what if they found a way back? Gotcha, bitch! It's been a decade since the failure that was Spy Kids 4, a movie Rodriguez was inherently forced to make, and in that time, he gave two of his most famous movie sequels, From Dust Till Dawn got its own show, he directed music videos for performers like Ariana Grande, Lady Gaga, and Demi Lovato, yes, yeah! debatably one of the better but not great live action anime films even though it had James Cameron's fingerprints all over it, an episode of The Mandalorian, and come 2020, his newest kids film straight to Netflix, We Can Be Heroes. And it's called that for reasons you can obviously guess. Oh, we can be heroes just for one day. A film apparently set in the same universe as Sharkboy and Lava Girl, with a focus on the superhero's children. So, canonically speaking, they <laughs> fucked. Let that sink in. Goodbye, childhood. <laughs> While there's been several superhero tales in the past 20 years delving into the politics and social complications to being a superhero behind the scenes, Rodriguez still tries to keep the magic alive that superheroes are still the glimmering light that we were raised upon, and not Jesus allegories. I mean, not all the superheroes here get along, they've just sort of lost their way. And that hope comes in the form of their children, who all have underdeveloped superpowers. But when the parents are taken captive by an alien armada, the kids have to use what little power they possess to work together and save them. And yes, that does sound like the plot of the original Spy Kids that Spy Kids 4 also ripped off. You will be staying in our underground stronghold, where the children of superheroes are kept safe while their parents fight enemy forces. We can't afford to have even one of you fall into enemy hands. Oh, no way! I just said the same thing, you crazy And just like every one of these movies, the main character is a distant loner who's bad at making friends until something amazing happened that gives them a realization, blah, blah, blah. These character arcs just sort of write themselves, don't they? I swear you could just plop any kid into one of these movies and instantly would be... Well, what are you waiting for? I don't know, something amazing, I guess. Each one of the kids have minor superpowers that correlate with their parents that alone don't do much, but when they work together, they can do more. And normally I'd say the parents, or rather the heroics, have great standalone powers, but truthfully, a lot of them are pretty damn lame. Miracle Guy is just Superman who isn't nearly as strong or interesting. Blinding Fast is just super speed, just that. Techno, as in tech no great job there, has no powers, just a vast knowledge of technology and gadgets, but I'd say Christian Slater is more useful here than he was in The Vindicators. Vance, stay calm! Oh, so you're the leader now because we gave you a jacket? You're the learning disabled kid we do photo ops with! Okay, uh, ouch, but- And Pedro Pascal, I guess he just has psychic abilities to his katanas, so basically he has Thor's power to summon his weapon, and he's really good with swords, but we never really see him use them, so I'd say he's just as lame. Oh, and Pedro Pascal is so not giving a shit that he's in this. It's like he owed Rodriguez a favor since he directed one of the best episodes of The Mandalorian, and now he's paying the price. I swear, he's about as dead here as he was in Game of Thrones. You should have come to me. You? Yeah. Mm. I remember all the articles claiming this was a Shark Boy and Lava Girl sequel, but first off, it's not because they're barely in the movie and barely focused on, plus it's more so like a pseudo-sequel, but I wasn't wrong in saying that technically these characters have had sex. And no, that's not Taylor Lautner. Aww. Rodriguez offered him a chance to come back, but he promised him that he wouldn't be doing much since there's almost no dialogue from either of them, and he would have to have his face covered to resemble something like Batman. And since Lautner grew in popularity later that decade, doing all that to such a big star would seem like a demerit. But they were able to get the original actor for Lava Girl back, which was pretty damn cool, honestly. She even agreed to dye her hair that same neon pink fire color. You know, she took that like a champ. Sorry, I just wanted to get all the Shark Boy and Lava Girl
general gossip out the way so I can talk about everything else. So as far as the kids go, I think they mainly stick the landing with their performances. I'm not asking for greatness, but I think Taylor Lautner, Jimmy Bennett, and Jolie Va Va Vanier, if I'm pronouncing that right, really set the bar for the child performances in these movies that everyone else is just below theirs, but truthfully passable. What do they call you? Wheels? Hey, I'm Wheels. I was kidding! I was kidding! Stop making my cutaway gags happen! And I also still wasn't kidding when I said elements from the first Spy Kids were done here. The children's parents are held captive, the children are being kept in a safe house, which later turns out to be a trap. As soon as they escape from the safe house, the lead protagonist takes them to the relative of their parents to get their help, escaping on a flying vessel to the villain's lair, walking through long corridors that seem eerily similar in structure, and since this hallway is a lavish purple, it makes me miss Floop even more. President Neil and Ami. Spell Neil and Ami backwards and you have... I'm an alien. Did you know your name is an anagram? This honestly seems like something that would be more suitable for a TV series, or at least a world worth growing upon. <coughs> Even though it is somewhat of a clone of Spy Kids, it works enough as a standalone film, and kids of this generation will probably love it the same way I loved the first movie as a kid. And I can at least say this film was made with more passion than Spy Kids 4, which he ultimately didn't want to make yet, so maybe this is the answer he really wanted for them. But just with Sharkboy and Lava Girl. In fact, the sequel is currently in the works with the help again of Netflix. They approached Rodriguez with the offer because no one makes live action family films like he does, and that is so true. With all we've seen, he clearly has a vision for the general audiences and with all the effort he's done and with each one it's hard not to appreciate it i think practically each one of these films are good enough in their own way for everyone except spy kids 4 nor does rodriguez talk down to his younger audience with them sure there's some potty humor once in a while but never too much to the point of annoyance except spy kids 4 and whether you're a young child or someone really drunk in their late 20s you'll never be bored so long as these movies exist and i can easily say the same for me